Jesus, be the center. Amen. Be my path. Be my guide. Let's pray. Father, that's our prayer. That you would be the center of our lives, not just an ingredient added. Lord, we owe you so much of our attention, so much of our lives that have yet to be turned over to you. And so, Lord, as we come before you here in this place, we recognize that we are frail, that we're faulty, that we fumble. That, Lord, we are in need of a word from you. We're in need of grace. We're in need of strength. And I pray that you might teach us as we look through your word that we would stand on the shoulders of those who have gone on before, who you spoke to to write the Holy Scriptures, that we might become like you, that we might learn to think like you and behave like you and feel like you, and that there would be less of us and more of you. I pray that you help us this morning to do that. Some of us, Lord, are struggling with things, and you know what they are. We lay them at your feet now. Those things that we would otherwise be preoccupied with, we trust you. And we pray that you would work that which is pleasing to you and us now. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, well, we're back in the book of Second Peter. We're still in chapter 1. I really hope we'll get done today. You know, I, I think I do this every week. I, I, I prepare to do like 21 verses. It, it's like... It's like going to a pizza place and you're hungry and you go, oh, let me have a pizza with everything on it. Oh, yeah, you're going to share that with anybody? No. No, it's all mine. And then you get two slices in and you're like, oh, no, what have I done? I need a box. <laughs> so that's what happened last week. If you weren't here, we went into chapter one and we got through a whole four verses and I always feel like a failure, but God is in control. Amen. In fact, we just sang about that. So previously at Grace, we talked about Peter being in prison, writing this, his last epistle, his swan song, if you will. So this is the last that we hear from the apostle before he's hung upside down just outside of Rome. And uh, we know that from history. But he introduces us to himself, reminding us he's Simon Peter. So he was the guy that Jesus found and renamed Peter, which means rock. And he says, your name is Simon, but you will be called Peter. It's interesting. I, there's a new name. There's, you know, we're going to get new names when we go to heaven. I guess he got his early. He introduces us to him as a bondservant, an apostle, both a slave and an authority, one who was an eyewitness of Christ to those of like precious faith, those of the same faith. So Peter puts himself on level with all the rest of us and talking about God and Savior Jesus Christ, which means that is attributing deity to Jesus. He is our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just so if, you're, if you have some Jehovah Witness friends, you might want to share that with. <laughs> Grace and peace. And he's going to talk a lot about knowledge in this book. He's got 13 references for it. Knowledge is kind of like a tool. Just because you have the tools doesn't mean you know how to fix the car, right? There are people selling tools all over Facebook Marketplace because they inherited them or got them as a gift, and they don't know how to use them. Knowledge is a tool. Wisdom is what helps you to know how to use the tool. So as we look through here, we're going to see a lot about knowledge, which is just raw information in which we're expected to do something with, with much like a box of tools. And he talks about how in his divine power, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory. The scripture teaches that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Jesus says, I give them life. I give them peace, not like the world gives. And he also comes to give life, real life, spiritual life. Can I get an amen? amen. Real spiritual life that he gives to us. And he gives us everything we need for life and godliness, which means our toolbox is full. 
It's there for the asking. Jesus said, ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Because everyone who asks receives. Everyone who you know, knocks, the door will be opened unto them. Everyone who seeks finds. And so the onus is on us to write the check. It's like the account is full. You just need to write a check. You need something? You need wisdom? It says in James, let him ask God who gives all men liberally without finding fault and it will be given. If you're going through a hard time and you don't understand it, God welcomes you to come and ask him about it. In fact, the very fact that we don't have an answer might mean that you haven't asked him. And so God has given us all that we need. He's given us all things. By the way, in the original language, all means all. Not just some, not most, all. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us by his glory and virtue, who is Jesus Christ. In Philippians, we saw that God is going to supply our every need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Yes. If you have a need, God has a purpose in it. If you believe in the sovereignty of God, that God is in charge of you and you're his kid, you got to know that whatever he's doing in your life, he has a purpose for. And submitting ourselves and understanding that is the first part in actually taking joy in those hardships. So when we go through them, we're not dismayed and wondering, what are we doing? What, what's God doing here? He forgot me. He hates me. He's mad at me. It's because I said this thing to so-and-so so and I shouldn't have done it. Let me apologize. And then this hard time will go away. And then the hard time doesn't go away. And then you're like, well, what else did I do? And it's not about that. It's about training. You know, we think that God, our heavenly father, is like our earthly father. And he's not anything like that. He has nothing but love for us, and he's there to train us and teach us, but he will supply all our needs. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. In other words, it's, it's pretty typical. But God is faithful, and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but along with the temptation will provide the way of escape. Notice it says the way of escape. The way of escape has been provided, hasn't it? In a person, in Jesus Christ. The way of escape, so that you might be able to bear it. We saw that we enter into the divine nature by these promises that God has given to us. Jesus says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. We looked at Philippians 4.19. These are good scriptures to memorize, by the way, because it says that through these promises that God has made, we enter into the divine nature. The divine nature. Would you say you have a divine nature? Now, listen, you might have an attribute or two that you think is divine, <laughs> but my nature is not one of them. Until I read the scripture and I have to put some faith behind it and say, well, God made me different. When I came and met him and I gave him my life, he made me different. I'm not the same person, and it's good for you. My wife didn't know that guy, and that's a good thing, because she'd have a lot of trouble having to forgive me for all of the stupid things that I once did before. Now she just has to forgive me for the stupid things I do now. <laughs> but you see, when we, when we have an intersection with the God of heaven through Jesus Christ, he changes us. We're adopted into the family, and the Spirit of God comes and takes up residence in our body. And you know what I'm talking about. Can I get an amen? amen? You get a new nature. And how do you enter into this divine nature? It's through God's promises. It's putting faith in what God has said, that what God says is true, and maybe what I feel all the time isn't. And so we enter into... These by the promises of God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways. Submit to him and he will make your paths straight. You believe that? Yes. It's by believing that that you walk in this divine nature. When you're trusting in him instead of yourself. Instead of, no, I got this. Stand back. I know what to do. Oh boy. We're in for a ride. It's better to say, Lord, what would you have me do? And do what he says. Scripture says in Acts 16... 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. 
that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's as simple as placing your faith in the finished work of what Jesus has done. And yet we can't do that without God's help, can we? In fact, there's little we can do without God's help. In fact, we can do nothing according to the scriptures. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9. Believe. That's how you enter into the divine nature. It's by faith in what Jesus has done and trusting his word. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, Jesus says in Jeremiah 29, 13. I don't think that's for some people. I think that's for all of us. You notice when it's when you get really serious and you have a real need and you're really on your knees and you're really praying, stuff happens when you have a real need. It's not when you just say, hey, God bless me. Thank you. Bye. And you go away and go on your own. It doesn't work that way. And millions of other scriptures. So keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Do you believe that? For him to leave you or forsake you would mean that God would have to die. And he who has always been and always will be will never die. So he can't. And if he loved you so much to send his only son for us to kill because of our sin, how will he not, along with him, give us all other things? It says in Romans chapter 8. So this is a very rich heritage that we have. This isn't just, hey, I found a really cool teacher. His name's Jesus. He lived 2,000 years ago. And a whole bunch of his followers wrote some books. It's not that. It's God came and visited in the, in the person of Jesus Christ. And because we believe in him, that's how we're saved. Amen? So we enter into this divine nature that we talked about. Ephesians says, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You know, most people think God's got these great scales in heaven where all your good deeds and all your bad deeds are put on the scale. And, and if you have more good than bad, then you get to heaven. If you have more bad than good, then you go to hell. It's worse than that. There are no good people in heaven. Only forgiven ones. Therefore, if anyone's in Christ... He is a new creation. The old is gone. Behold, all is, the, the new has come. Because Jesus Christ makes us new from the inside out. So, we, we've given these promises and we've escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The scripture says that we've escaped, past tense, the traps of the world. So that you, in, in your own desires aren't controlled by sin any longer. It no longer reigns in your mortal body, it says in chapter 6 of Romans, which means I'm not a slave anymore. Are you? No. Jesus will set you free. I can give you a whole list of things that just fell off of my life when I came to know Jesus. I can tell you a whole bunch of new problems I had. Like I had a whole bad set of friends. And I would either be dead or in prison if I continued doing what they were doing. It's just not that way. I've escaped. That's a Ford Escape. That's a joke. <laughs> Sorry. And we have escaped. We have escaped judgment as well. Jesus not only took the power of sin away, so it no longer controls us in our sinful nature, but he also took away the punishment that we deserve for that sinful nature. Aren't you glad? Considering we inherited it from our parents, that's, that's a pretty good deal right there because you can't uninherit it and you can't disavow it in your own children. Any of you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Sinful nature dwells there as well. So this week, we're going to try to push beyond those four verses. I beat myself up a lot. It's okay. I get over it. Verse 5. But also, for this very reason, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. We went through this last week. So the scripture says, you've got faith. Awesome. That's a gift from God so that nobody can boast. 
Awesome. You got faith. You're a Christian. You're in Christ. Hallelujah. You're done, right? I got a golden ticket. I'm done. Oh, no. You've just started baking. <laughs> faith. Add to your faith virtue, which is uh, doing good things that are admirable. Not, not just... Uh, not just super fantastic things, but very good and profitable things for other people. And to add to your virtue, knowledge. So we're commended to walk in faith, which means we have to take some steps. It's not that we make ourselves saved. It's because we are saved, we can walk. Amen? Amen. Because we're saved, we can do these things. So I can add the virtue and I can add knowledge, but then along with that knowledge, a little bit of humility, some self-control. Because just because you know something doesn't mean you should tell everyone you know. Right? Amen. Okay, good. I'm glad. Because I'd hate to think I got a room full of gossips here. Or, you know what it's like when, when somebody has to tell you how smart they are? I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share a secret. I have a problem with titles. You got a problem with titles? Hello, my name is Doctor. Well, you, you, you're never poking anything in my body. I don't know you. You're not my doctor. I am professor. You're not my professor. I'm not paying you. There are people that take on these titles, and they love to throw them around because it's, it's, it's kind of uh, arrogance. And so I never introduce myself as pastor. People have to squeeze it out of me. So what do you do? Ah, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. It's <laughs> my usual answer. Because as soon as you tell them you're a pastor, they're like, oh. Or they get angry. And then they come up with, a, I've got a question for you. <laughs> OK. Let me get my mitt on and put my, all right, I'm ready. Pitch it over to the plate. Knowledge. Just because you have knowledge doesn't mean you need to tell everybody everything. So add to your knowledge some self-control. Know when you can add it, when it should be. Listen, I like salt, but too much will ruin the soup, right? And knowledge can do that. If you're pouring knowledge on people, pouring knowledge on people, uh, they may not want to receive what you have to tell them, right? So use a little self-control and some discernment while you're looking at them. But as you're exercising virtue and you have this knowledge and you're exercising self-control, persevere. Don't stop. Keep going. Don't quit. Don't say, oh, I did enough. I'm done. Don't do that. Keep going. Persevere. This is the life that we live. And to that, you add godliness, which is being like God. Oh, my goodness. There's a, there's a giant list of what it is to be like God. But if you don't read the word of God, it's going to be hard for you to emulate that. But godliness... Godliness, you know, somebody strikes you on one cheek, you turn to him the other. I mean, you can't do that unless you build on your faith all these other things. You know, it's kind of up the list. And then there's brotherly kindness, which seems to me to be a simpler thing. It should be down below. But, you know, brotherly kindness is usually in the face of somebody who's not worthy of it. And then ultimately love. Love is the goal and if you can get to the place where you have this agape, that's the, the Greek word for unconditional, no strings attached, constantly overflowing and giving out of the abundance that God gives you. If you can get to that place, that's the ultimate, isn't it? And if you can find yourself doing that, being sacrificial for other people and doing it Godward, that's really the goal. And we saw it with Jesus, right? He even said, there's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And so that's why it's at the top of the stairs. That's why it's the ultimate goal. And I don't know if you guys are, are looking at these stairs, you're wondering what step you're on. I think you can be on various steps at various times, almost simultaneously in various aspects of your life. Um, you know, being perseverant with some things I'm good at, other things, nah. So you might have the same nah as me. So for these, here's a promise. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Now there's an interesting passage. If you continue to do this, and if you're on this road and you keep walking on this road, what's the promise? You will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know why? Because you have to be in constant contact as you're doing this, right? Hey, Lord, I learned this new thing. And he's like, yeah, but it kind of is in the face of this over here. Oh, really? Oh, well, I mean, what is that thing over there? And you research that thing over there and you're like, oh, I get it. You have to constantly be in contact. You have to constantly be in prayer as you're walking in faith to do all these things. And that's how you get this deep knowledge. And you'll never wake up one morning and say, wow, I haven't talked to God in like a long time. I wonder if he left me or if I'm saved. I wonder, do you realize it's in the midst of this pursuit that our, our life is healthy and vibrant? It's we're doing those things that God made us to do. You know, what's the worst thing you could do with a thoroughbred horse. Retire them and put them in a stall. That, they just get fat and lazy and, you know, they, they, you have to pay to have them stud somebody. That's about all they do. It's all self. But you know what? A horse loves to run. If you ever watch a thoroughbred, they'll run around for no reason. They'll just run around, kick their feet up like a golden retriever. You ever see a golden retriever? They just... <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? I don't know. I don't know, but I'm happy. <laughs> Tail's going like this. They're moving her whole body. They're excited. <laughs> Worst thing you do that animal, put him in a cage. And he's like, it's the same with us. We thrive on doing those things that God has created us to do in this divine nature. And as we do those things, we experience real joy in real life. So if you continue to do these things, you won't be unfruitful or barren in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, because you're going to know more and more about him as you walk this life with him. For you lack these things. Now, what do you do with people who lack these things? Or what if you lack these things? Maybe you're short-sighted. Maybe you can't see the long haul. Maybe you're, you're busy looking at your work, or you're busy looking at things too close up, and you're not looking far enough. You're, you've lost your farsight, if you will. Even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from old sins. Have you ever had a time in your life like that? I have. When I'm walking and I just forget about the Lord and I kind of leave him, I, I take the exit and, and start walking in the flesh instead of walking in the spirit, and I wake up one day and I go, my, I hate my life. It's miserable. But it's because I was the one who left. God never leaves me, but I leave him. And so maybe I'm short-sighted and I've forgotten. Maybe I'm blind. You know, when you, you feel like you're praying and God doesn't answer you, you feel like you're talking to the ceiling, you wonder if God was ever real, you wonder if it was a, your imagination, the devil loves that. He gets on your shoulder and starts whispering stuff. And you're in the battle and you don't have the resource. You don't have gas in your motor. It's happened to me. And I can tell you it's because I wasn't doing the stairs. I wasn't doing the stair climber, you know. And that's what keeps us healthy. It keeps us from lacking sight, from being unfruitful and barren in our spiritual lives. So when was the last time you opened the Bible and read? You know, that's like, that's like ordering ribs, you know, and you're chewing on the, oh, yeah. I don't know. I like, I get, I guess I'm getting hungry. I haven't anything to eat. <laughs> but the word of God is like meat to your soul. It's one of those things that will fortify you and it'll straighten you out. And you're like, Oh, I forgot. God loves me. I forgot. I don't know. You ever forget stuff like that? Simple things like that. Some, I, I forget things like that all the time because I'm stupid, but God uses me. So I want to bear fruit in my life. I want to be like this vine right here. I don't know how you get those things to grow, but I think it's because you're giving it all the, what it needs to grow, like our, our spiritual life. I think about Samson. You remember Samson, the skirt chaser? 
in the book of Judges where God wanted to do a work and he supernaturally got involved with a woman and helped her to have a baby and they raised him right and they didn't give him anything that was from uh, grapes or grapevine or even grape juice, stayed away from that, dead things and grew his hair long and all of this is a testimony that he was consecrated to God. And then, of course, those things, one by one, took their place where he gave them up and he walked away from God and he lost his eyesight. He lost his eyesight because he didn't hold on to what God called him to do. And he decided he'd live a sloppy life. And it's interesting that it says, you know, even to blindness, you become short-sighted, even to blindness, if you don't stay on this track, if you're not going to add to your faith these things. And there are lots of people who are like that. They're like Samson. And you wonder how, you know, these people, they call themselves Christians, like they've give, given their lives to Christ, and yet they don't seem to bear any fruit. They don't seem to have any perseverance or any wisdom or knowledge, or they, they don't seem to have grace. And like, what's up with that? Lord, what? And then, of course, we're always tested to judge. Well, they're not saved. Or they are saved. Or maybe they're saved. You, know, you don't know. Right? Do you think you can tell somebody's heart from the outside? You, you probably know what I'm thinking right now. <laughs> you ever met somebody who thinks they can read your mind? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't want to be like Samson. I don't want to walk around with my eyes closed. And, but that'll happen if we're not constantly coming before the Lord and, and presenting ourselves and saying, Lord, I'm going to be that living sacrifice that you called me to be. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. So that's what we do, right? Right, friends? Okay, I was wondering if you listen. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. You know what it doesn't say? It didn't say save yourself. Make sure you do all this stuff so you're going to heaven doesn't say that. Make sure as you're doing all these things, this will prove that you're saved because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do it. So if you're really a thoroughbred, you should be able to run really well. So let's see how you do. Nah, I'd rather sit here in a stall. Well, then you'll never, never know if you're a thoroughbred. You see how that works? Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. By the way, God is the one who calls. God is the one who elects. We're the ones who respond. And if you want to know if you're his, you need to check your life. But if you do these things, you will never stumble. How many of you never want to stumble spiritually? How about physically? I got a few more hands for that one. Okay. Yeah, I don't want to stumble spiritually. So how do you do that? If you're always adding to your faith and always looking to God to provide those things, and if you're walking with Jesus, walking in the spirit, as the scripture says, then you won't stumble. Why? Because you're holding on to his hand, and he won't let you stumble. That's a promise. I'm taking that to the bank. What about you? I'm, Lord, I'm going to hold on to your hand because I don't want to stumble. I could slip off here any minute. Be more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. And so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wow, it almost sounds like I'm working my way to heaven. Doesn't it sound that way? Well, since I don't love to argue like some people, I'll just share it with you because it's hard to have an argument with a whole room. <laughs> The scriptures uh, says that we should examine ourselves in 2 Corinthians 13, 8. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Can't you see for yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you actually fail the test. You see, he's encouraging the Corinthians. You got you to gotta check, check, make sure you're saved. Make sure you're saved. It doesn't mean that you get yourself saved. It means you make sure you're saved. So how do you do that? Well... Let me see what's growing on my branches. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, self-control. Do I have these things coming out of my life? Are they ebbing from me? Or do I have to like, oh, I gotta, uh, hi. <laughs> or is it something that comes out of the abundance of my heart? 
Lord, save me. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like, oh, I, I got to pray to get saved again. How many of you have ever done that? Save me again, Lord. Save me again. Or save me more. <laughs> you check the list. And by the way, I think that's absolutely adorable. It usually shows a lack of confidence in what God has done, but I find it absolutely adorable. The opposite would be worse. Yeah, I'm saved. Pass the cocaine. <laughs> yeah, that's worse, right? Yeah, I'm saved. Hey, when are you going out later? Because I want to rob you. I'm going to break into your house. That's a, that's a worse thing. People think they're saved and they got no fruit. They, they're, you're the wrong kind of tree. So, if you never want to stumble, this is, the, this is it. So, read this over, guys, because, my goodness, if we do this, we'll never stumble. And so, there'll be an entrance supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You mean I worked myself to heaven? No, not at all. But I think there are some people that when they enter heaven, there's going to be a parade and there are some people when they enter heaven, the scripture says they'll be smoking. Their hair is going to just be smoking. Their, their clothing is going to be like holes and, you know, you got to like put them out when they get there because they just, just made it. The scripture talks about those who will be tested. It says all of our works when we go to heaven are going to be tested with fire. And that which is gold and silver and precious, gold, precious gems, that will last. And that will be praise and honor and glory to God. And then all of the stuff that's hay, wood, and stubble, all that that burns, it's going to burn off. And there are going to be some people who make it into heaven, but as through the flames. In other words, you're just... Yeah. You know, your last breath, you ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life or something, and you're, you're in. And you know what? Somebody who's in after just that prayer, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. But I think it's more awesome if you can bring, like, big sacks of stuff and say, Lord, I submitted my life to you, and this is what you did with my life. And I'm going to lay it at your feet for your glory and your honor. That is what I want. I want an entrance, this abundant entrance. I don't want to be like, hey, you made it. Praise God. Next station. You know, oh, what are you doing here? I don't want that. What are you doing here? Our profession and our progression equals assurance. Our profession is what we say. Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. And then when there's actually progression and there's maturity that comes into my life, what that does is it gives me assurance that I'm really saved, that I really was changed. Because I don't do all the same stupid things that I used to do. And there are still things that are falling off in my life. And there are new aspects of my maturity where I'm becoming more like Christ. Wow. If you want assurance that you're really his, you should see that stuff. And if you don't see that stuff, you have no right to feel assured. Not because you didn't earn it. It's because you're not bearing fruit. And Jesus is the vine. We're the branches. He says, the one who abides in me bears much fruit. So we should be bearing fruit, people. And it should be a progression. So along with our profession, we have this progression. And then what it causes is this deep down confidence that we're his. And that's assurance. If you ever wonder if you're a Christian, you got to wonder, are you progressing? Right. You, may, you may be making a profession, but are you growing? Because that's necessary, right? Because you can't stagnate. It's like salmon going upstream. You know, salmon going upstream, everything's great until they stop swimming. And they're going downstream. And there's a waterfall. <laughs> and it won't go well for you. So it's one of those things where we have to continue pursuing those things that God has created us for and walking in those things that he preordained that we would walk in them. So our conduct and our character do count. You know, there are, there are antinomians. There are those who believe, well, uh, you know, you don't have to obey anything. Just believe in Jesus and then you can live however you want and everything's cool. Well, those people are called miserable 
Because if you're carrying around the Spirit of God, you can't continue to live in sin. First John is very careful. If you, you, if you say that you love God and you hate your brother, you're a liar. You don't love God because you hate your brother. It's made in his image. So there are all of these tests. The whole book of First John is like a great test. But our conduct and our character count. It matters. And it's revelatory as to whether we have a relationship with God or not. Because we don't bear fruit in and of ourselves. We only bear fruit when we abide in the vine. In 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 16, here's the passage I was referring to. Each, each one's work will become clear for the day, that's the day of the Lord, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work of which he has built on, if he built on it indoors, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So do, not, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Is that something that you're unsure of, like the Corinthians were? Listen, we're going to get tested when we get to heaven. It's better we get tested now to make sure everything's, on the, uh, you know, everything's well. It's kind of like getting a pre-certified used car. You, know, you want to be pre-certified on this side. You don't want to find out on the other. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Peter sounds like a nag. <coughs> For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you of always of these things. I don't want to always be reminded of anything. How about you? No. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you. Remember, this is his last letter. He's writing from prison, and he's saying, I, I don't have a problem reminding you, which means I know I'm not telling you anything new that you don't know. And by the way, I don't have any imagination that I'm telling all of you revelatory new things that you've never heard. It's also my job to remind of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. By the way, Peter calls his body his tent. It's uh, actually, it's the word for tabernacle, by the way, which is very appropriate because it housed the presence of God. As long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. That word decease in the original language is exodus, by the way. It says, when I, when I exit, when I leave, I want to make sure you guys remember this. That's why he's writing it down. I wonder, if you or I were to disappear from the earth today, and the Lord would take us home. What lasting legacy do you leave? Peter was not just a demonstration, but he left this letter, and it continues to bless all of us. Amen. If you were to leave today, what do you leave? It's a good thing to think about, because then we don't waste our time on things that are less important. So a, a, a brief reminder... <laughs> I, I just want to remind you, and I don't have a problem reminding you and stirring you up. Do you know people who stir you up? I have a couple special friends in this church who stir me up. Oh, you know who they are. You know who you are. Let's see, who can I pick on? No, I'm just kidding. He's stirring them up. You know, it's a good thing to stir people up. I, I have no problem with that. It's enjoyable. You know, you ever see boys fight when they wrestle around and, you know, there are mothers going, oh, no, don't, don't do that. You're hurting my boy. You, you ever see boys wrestling around? We used to do that, knock over plants and all kinds of stuff. To the point where my mom just went like this, uh, and walked away. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot learned in all those little tussles on the rug, you know? And, you know, you, you end up with a bloody nose, or you end up with a big scrape right down your arm, or, 
you know, a, a broken finger like this, and you go, I think I broke it. Oh, I can't believe it. You got to go to the hospital again. But there are things in that tussle. There's strength that is acquired. There are ways of being able to tussle and win that you learn only when you do that. And so to stir people up, I, I used to, I used to get offended if somebody wanted to stir me up. I didn't see it as a stirring it up. I thought it was a challenge. What, are you challenging me? You want a piece of me? And I would get offended. I don't do that now. I'm like, what else you got? Because I will develop skills, and I will develop strength, and I will be, you will be a, a, a chisel where God goes, and knocks stuff off of me. It's good. But you have to submit yourself to God before you do that, right? There's a little bit of knowledge. So we have this book that Peter is leaving us, the last bit of information. James 1.21 says this, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. You know, what a tremendous benefit we have with the word of God and the ability that it can save our souls if we have faith in what God has said. It's putting faith in what God has said that saves us. It's because we believe that Jesus is who Jesus said he was. And we give him our lives, right? And so we need to receive the word of God as food, as seed, as nourishment for our souls. And if we don't do that, I don't know about you, but, um, you know, you can, you can look at the word of God and say, ah, that ain't right. No, I don't believe that. No, uh, this is kind of nice. I like this. God will provide for all my needs according to his riches and glory. I like that one. I'm going to keep this one. Well, uh, he chastises all those he loves. <laughs> I'm going to pull that out. You know, Thomas Jefferson used to do that. He had a Bible, except when he didn't like certain parts of it, he tore the pages out. I hope you guys don't do that. It's not like an all-you-can-eat buffet where you take a little bit of Proverbs, a little bit of, you know, you, you have to take the entirety of it because that's how cults get started, by the way, is you just pick one thing, one ism or one verse, and you go, this is it. This is what, it, this is the whole entirety of the scripture. No, it's not. It's just one little aspect. You hear about the blind men trying to explain to, to, to one another what an elephant is? You got one guy in the front, he's on the trunk. He's like, an elephant is like a great long snake. It's like a tube with wind. And then the guy on the side is by the ear and he goes, no, it's like a giant piece of paper. And it moves. And the other guy on the side, he's by the side of the elephant. He goes, no, an elephant is like a giant wall textured like brick. Then there's a guy in the back. This description is, it's like a tree. It's like a mighty cedar tree. And it doesn't smell so good. <laughs> but as we go through the word of God, we can find little nuggets of truth and we think that's the whole truth. And it's not, it's a truth. But it's in the scriptures. The scripture is the whole truth. That's the whole elephant. Make sense? Yes. Okay. I don't know sometimes if I'm getting through. So, <laughs> verse 16. Peter saying, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice, I love that, such a voice, came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son of whom I am well pleased. And we heard his voice, which came from heaven when we were with him in the holy mountain. Now, Peter is giving us his first person recollection of what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration. If you remember, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, went up onto a mountain. And as they were up there, the disciples did what disciples do best. They fell asleep. <laughs> Jesus would go up onto the mountain all the time to pray. And so he decided to take these sleepy boys with them. 
and they fall asleep. But in the middle of what Jesus is doing, which is he's having a conference with <laughs> Moses and Elijah, in the middle of this conference, Jesus is now radiating his true glory and who, who he really was, was coming out. And he was talking with Moses and Elijah. And without name tags, these guys knew it was Moses and Elijah, which tells me I won't have a problem remembering names in heaven, which is good. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking to him. Notice they're not talking to the disciples because they just woke up. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let, let's make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him, or listen to him. I noticed that Peter didn't mention the last part when he was giving the story of what happened on this mountain, that such a voice came. He doesn't mention that God told him to shut up. <laughs> Peter interrupts a conversation he wasn't even invited to and says, I got an idea. Let's build three tabernacles. Actually, I believe it's in the, in the book of Zechariah. It says that when the Messiah comes, his second coming, that it will be, uh, they will reestablish the Feast of Tabernacles. And so it might be the reason why Peter was so anxious to do this. He thought he was ushering it in. It would also explain why later on they're arguing about who's the greatest and who's going to sit on his right hand and his left hand, because they were thinking this is his second coming. His first coming involves his crucifixion. So... <laughs> It wasn't that he would just made three little outhouses out, up there on the mountain. But the fact that they just wanted to stay up there with Jesus, I get that. How about you? I just want to stay with Jesus up on the mountain. But you know what? We've got work to do. And there are things going on down in the valley, like here, that we need to be involved in. So he's giving us what happened with this such a voice that came to him. This is my beloved son of whom I'm well pleased. It's one of three times when God speaks from heaven and interrupts what's going on just to approve of his son. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's interesting. Peter begins by telling us about this experience that he had with the Lord. And then he says, you guys have something that's even bigger and better than that experience. You have the word of God. You have the word of God. Amen. Because experiences come and go, right? Right? Like yesterday, Dave and Irma got married yesterday, which was a blessed event for those guys. If they're watching, light clapping from everyone. So, but that's done. That's over. Party was had, the dress is hung up on a hanger, suit goes back to whoever's being rented from, um, all the bills now have to be paid. The event is over. The excitement is now moved into the work of being married. Some of you married people know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the excitement of the wedding day and the reception and all of that and having all of your friends around you. And yet, there's something better than that event. It's their marriage. So the wedding was a fabulous thing, but now there's the marriage and all of the good things that come out of that and all of the iron sharpening iron and becoming more like Christ in that. So he's saying, you guys have something better than what we had up on the mountain when we saw Jesus transformed. You have the word of God. You have this more sure word of prophecy that you can hold on to. 
In Psalm 119, uh, which is all about the word of God, by the way, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. You know, the instruction that we have from the scriptures is so much more important than any experience you will ever have. You know, you can go to a concert, you can go to uh, where a bunch of Christians get together and learn, you can go to prophecy conferences, you can go to all these kind of things, and all of these experiences will never do what the Word of God can do inside of you, if you believe it. And God works that which is pleasing to Him. And in the law of the testimony, oh, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to His to this word, it is because they have no light in them. Isaiah says that the way that you can tell whether something's true or not is whether it lines up with the word. Does it line up with the word of God? Let's, let's go, to the, go to the videotape, so to speak. Let's go to the testimony. Let's go to the law. Psalm 119, verse 11, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Do you know anything else that has the antiseptic ability to, to keep you from sin? It's the word of God. It's hiding, my, hiding in my heart your word so I don't sin against you. I, try to, I used to make it a real regular basis of memorizing scripture on a weekly basis. Um, getting older, I'm lucky to remember the address to my home sometimes. Uh, and I know because I had to think about it for a second. I was signing papers yesterday. Your address. Okay. I, I had to go to the file, you know. Which address? Oh, my home. Uh, one, one. Okay, oh, there, there, I got it. You, you guys are like that, right? I remember one time my phone died and I had to call my wife and I couldn't remember her number. <laughs> I've become so dependent on my phone. Anyway, but I hide the, the word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It has the antiseptic ability to squash any of the battle that's going on in my head. And if I'm struggling, it's the sword of the spirit, right? And so we pull it out and we can do battle with the word of God, that which we know God has said, which is true. In Acts 17, 11, speaking of those from uh, Berea, these were more fair-minded than those of Thessalonica, that they received the word with all readiness and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Paul went to the Bereans and he spoke to them the word of God. And they said, we'll get back to you. And they opened and they did a fact check and they checked the word of God to make sure that it was in there. And he says they were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they were willing to do that. Those are people that are actually willing to do the word of God. If you're willing to find out if it's from him or not and not just believe what some guy said in the front of the stage here on a Sunday morning. Next week, we're going to jump into chapter 2, and what Peter's going to tackle in chapter 2 are the false prophets, those who are propagating bad doctrine. And so he's going to say a lot of strong words. If you want to read on ahead, it's uh, very involved, and it, there's a lot of Old Testament taken into consideration, and you have a parallel passage in the book of Jude, and we'll talk all about that next week. Mm -hmm.